Good morning, everybody. How are we doing today? Uh, my name is Dan, the Jazz Shepherd. Uh, welcome to my little cafe. Today we're going to talk about my favorite tone code. And uh, I'm not going to lie, I'm doing this to get some views. Because I talk normal records and jazz history and stuff that's not being reissued. And most people have zero interest in it. And uh, when I talk about this reissue stuff, I get a lot more views. And uh, so you got to mix this stuff in sometimes, I guess. Uh, the Tone Poet stuff to me has always been of limited uh, value, in part because I have most of the actual releases from Blue Note, and even a lot of the Japanese and posthumous stuff post-label, but uh, they have put out quite a few titles that I didn't have that were uh, issued in Japan or in the 80s, but I hadn't gotten them yet, or the American cover was so bad I didn't want it. And so I have plenty of tone pull, probably about 20. Uh, <clears throat> these are my 10 favorite at this point. And again, so if it's something that's already been issued by Blue Note itself back in the day, we won't be including any of that stuff. I haven't bought hardly any of those because I already have older pressings of those. So we're going to start off with uh, what we're listening to right now. And that's Grant Green. And I listened to this the other day in the cafe. And I actually like this record quite a lot. This has several different covers. Uh, this is when Sonny Clark was a, kind of a staple at Blue Note, although if it's from 62, which is what I notated, this means this is actually upon his return to Blue Note. He leaves for a little while, comes back, uh, makes Leapin and Lopin, and then he passes away not that long after that. Sam Jones is a fantastic bass player. He was kind of an icon at the Riverside label. He was a, like a house jazz bass player there. Uh, he makes a Blue Note appearance here, along with the great Art Blakey, who is as Blue Note as Blue Note gets. Uh, it's a fairly warm session. doesn't have a super hard driving Blakey backbeat like you would assume with some of Blakey's stuff. Uh, it, and Clark also doesn't impose his natural kind of uh, vitriol that he seems to have on a lot of his own sessions. All in all, it's a very nice, light record that's perfect coffee shop fodder and a great cover and a great gatefold by uh, Kevin Gray and uh, company. They do a nice job, no question about it. And uh, the prices have been going up, but the prices of everything has been going up. These aren't in any kind of particular order. They're just the 10 that I've bought and that I've enjoyed so far the most. Uh, Lee Morgan, the Raja. I believe it was from 1966, which puts it towards the sale. Uh, he's got his uh, little bangs haircut going on here, which was all kind of a cute look for him, I thought. Uh, Mobley, Cedar Walton, Paul Chambers, and Billy Higgins round out this lineup. And it's one of those sessions where Mobley kind of always adapts himself to the leader of the session. So you get Mobley here in quite an aggressive... Uh, fiery disposition, which isn't Hank Mobley's normal uh, interaction with the world. Cedar Walton's a pretty young and up-and-coming piano player at this point. On uh, 66, he's probably has his first leader album out at Prestige around this time. He's done quite a bit of side work. He's worked with the Jazz Messengers. Of course, Paul Chambers is just an, an absolute legend at this point. Uh, he's left Miles Davis He's working a lot with Wynton uh, Kelly and, and Jimmy Cobb as a trio. They back a lot of people as a group, but Chambers was, was getting a lot of work as a sideman as well. And again, Chambers doesn't long for the world at this point. He only has a few years left. And then Billy Higgins, uh, one of the great drummers of this era, who's still a pretty young man at this point, and he's on hundreds of sessions. So you really have a great lineup here, led by uh, Lee Morgan, who he's not really doing the boogaloo stuff here. He, uh, I mean, he starts off very much a hard bop guy, goes to VJ for a while in like 60, 61, comes back to Blue Note, has a huge hit with Sidewinder and a couple of other Boogaloo numbers. And I think Alfred and Frank kind of wanted him to kind of stay that because it was successful. But Lee, Lee definitely was more than just a, a Boogaloo dance player. He wanted to be on the edges. So he'll challenge some of the avant-garde, he'll challenge some of the boundaries of free without ever really jumping across that line. Fantastic LP from 66 to Raja. Uh, a, a, a cool session by Wayne Shorter, the great saxophonist 
who of course played with Miles Davis for quite a long time. Also a VJ alumni. Uh, he does some fine stuff there. Uh, Chambers is also a VJ for a while. A little label at a Gary, Indiana, run by a black couple. But uh, etc. was a session that got sat on for a while. Uh, it's a great record. We have Herbie Hancock, Wayne Schroeder, Cecil McBee, and Joe Chambers. So you end up having some of that Miles Davis alumni here. It's in that same vein to a degree. It's not simple, easy, blues-driven gospel jazz. It definitely has a bit more composition, a little bit more difficulty. Uh, it's not just a simple, laid-back jam session. It's certainly, there's more composition going on in Shorter's tunes, and I believe he composes most of these. All of them except for the one by Gil Evans, Barracudas, General Assembly. Uh, again, Shorter was a very intellectual player, but he still had a lot of blues and gospel in him. Uh, Bobby Hutcherson, Oblique, again a nice uh, release I did not have from 67. This is at the very end of the Alfred Lyon, Frank Wolf days at Blue Note. Uh, Herbie Hancock, Albert Stinson on the bass, and Joe Chambers on the drums, a couple of younger fellas there. Uh, Hutcherson is another one of those players, a bit like Mobley, that can really adapt and graft his sound and what he's doing based on the players he's playing with. And he has a record that comes out on Tone Poet uh, that was his first session, and this is quite a ways away from that already. And he definitely dabbles in some of the avant-garde and some of the edges of the composition and the challenging sounds that were happening in the mid-60s, but Hutcherson always has some blues in him and some gospel in him, and he can bring it back to that place where you resolve the melody and... Uh, I like Hutcherson. I think his records are fantastic. His career at Blue Note is uh, noteworthy. He got some other stuff later that's also good, but it's really it's his Blue Note stuff people are really after. Uh, Jackie McLean, tipping the scales. Again, you have Sonny Clark with Butch Warren and Art Taylor. The great Art Taylor is a fantastic drummer. Butch Warren on the bass. This one's from 62. Uh, Jackie's probably still high on the junk at this point. Uh, he has only been recently brought into lead records at Blue Note. He does some side work earlier on. But I think he comes over in 60 or 61 to Blue Note from Prestige. And this session got sat on for a while. As a number of Jackie McLean sessions did. Jackie has a bit of an edge to him. He's an alto player. He's bright. He's got some hints of dissonance. Uh, he often plays kind of a sharp sound that puts an edge on a lot of what he's doing. Uh, it's almost unnatural at times. But it's also very convicted, which offsets some of that and gives you some empathy to, to step into where he's coming from. Uh, Jackie was, I mean, he plays with Parker, so he's definitely a legend. Uh, he, li he lives, he stays alive until the early 2000s. So he has a long career in the music. He spends a lot of time in Europe. I think he was in Denmark for a while. That was a fine session. I was happy when they finally issued it. Although I was a bigger McLean fan probably 10 years ago than I am now. One of my favorite players of all time is, again, Hank Mobley, featuring Kenny Dorham and Sonny Clark. Curtain Call was a record I kind of wanted for a long time. It took a while for it to finally come out. Tone Pool had several release dates for it and never actually came out until it kept being put, postponed and put back, if I remember. But Dorham with Hank Mobley is a wonderful melancholic pairing. Dorham's one of those kind of mid-register trumpet players who's not as minimal as Miles, but he's not as full of bravado and fire as a Morgan or even a Donald Byrd. He's a little bit more subdued, a little bit more thoughtful. Uh, his sound has some milk and cloudiness. It's just a contemplative player, and Mobley is just kind of dovetailing in with that sound effortlessly. Again, Sonny Clark is one of the real drivers of these sessions with Jimmy Rouser on the bass and Art Taylor on the drums. Again, you're just getting fantastic sessions that Blue Note didn't issue that are on par with a lot of what other labels did issue. Uh, the rehearsal time that Blue Note allowed these guys to do and that they got paid to do allows for these records to all be quite uh, remarkable and noteworthy. Although I do think it's important before you get too into the, the missing episodes of an artist, you should know their main career. You should know their body of work. And I think there's a lot of collectors out there today buying the reissue stuff that have a bunch of the lost episodes of a TV show but don't have the TV show. 
you don't have the context of an artist's career unless you have their real body of work and then add in these missing sessions they have context then you understand why maybe this wasn't an issue was it a money thing was it a, a sound of the session thing was someone not up to par that day that stuff's all more easy to understand and grasp when you have a better idea of the artist's body of work where their career arc was going who they were playing with what point in their career they were at where, where were they at with their addictions all that stuff should factor in and so I, by all means, I'm going to say, as I've always said, you need to have the artist's body of work. And you can't just be settling for what's being reissued. You're going to end up with a bunch of outtakes and unworthy releases of the Thelonious Monks and the Charlie Parkers and the, all these guys. And you're not going to have their main contributions to the body of Cattle the Cannon. And I just think that's a strange approach. These things are meant to be filler. They're meant to be kind of appetizers and little digestives that you ingest and, and get to understand, but they can't be the main course. They have to be an asterisk. This was something they also did and never got issued. And oftentimes, as Rudy Van Gelder will even say, most of the stuff that didn't get issued didn't get issued for a reason. And most often, it was the players who said, I don't want that take put out. And so that's why sometimes Bob Weinstock at Prestige would erase all alternate takes. That's why a lot of the Prestige CDs don't have alternate takes. They they were deleted for a reason. They reused the tape. And so I think it's something that does get lost in these reissue clamor to be getting all these new releases and titles. You end up with a very unclear image of an artist body of work and again it's like having a TV episode that had 7 seasons 150 episodes and 4 of the episodes you have of the 6 you have were episodes that were never aired you don't really understand the TV show so those episodes that you have have zero context they have zero meaning so these are meant to be for the completionists but you need to have the other stuff kind of first I mean, you can still enjoy these for what they are on their own, but just waiting for stuff to be reissued, there's so much stuff out there used still. Uh, this is a great record, uh, Donald Bird, the Detroit native, fantastic upper register trumpet player with a lot of brilliance, a lot of rhythm and blues, a lot of the black neighborhood in Detroit and his sound and soul. He's playing with Pepper Adams, a fellow Detroit native. Herbie Hancock, Doug Watkins, and Teddy Robinson round out this session. Uh, again, one of the records I kind of wanted for a while after I completed the Blue Note Canon. I'm like, boy, I'd like to get that chant session by Bird. I was happy when Tone Poet did issue this. Again, they do such a great job giving these nostalgic looking Francis Wolf covers. It's one of the things they do the best is really giving these, these covers that will blend in with the rest of the Blue Note Canon. Uh, another record I was really excited about them issuing was Sonny Clark's My Conception. Fantastic session with Blakey and Chambers in the rhythm section along with Mr. Clark. And you have Bird and Hank Mobley on the trumpet and the tenor. Uh, I mean, that's a pretty outstanding Jazz Messenger-esque uh, session. Royal Flush is great on this. Junka is great on this. Uh, again, to get some insight into who Sonny Clark is, you can kind of read his bio and his life in Pittsburgh and his parents' parental issues and moving out to the West Coast. And I mean, he starts off in some fairly cool sessions before he ends up being a stalwart at Blue Note in 5960, leading some of the greatest hardball sessions that ever happened, which is quite a departure from where a guy like Sonny Clark started. Uh, Tina Brooks, The Waiting Game. This was only on CD for the longest time. Brooks' body of work is very small bad drug problem again he died quite young I mean, maybe he didn't pass maybe he just disappeared from the scene but uh brooks has a great album called back in the tracks at blue note that didn't get issued right away but it did come out eventually and there's two or three other titles by him that, were, that all got sat on tone poets issued most of his stuff at this point i think there's one with jackie mcclain that needs to be done and i'd like to get that when it does come out but you have tina brooks with the great trumpet player johnny coles and Johnny Coles is kind of an overlooked guy. He has one record at Blue Note as a leader. He's a record at Epic. But he's a great player. Plays a lot of fire. Some Red Rodney in his sound. Uh, he's definitely not like a Miles trumpet player. He's much more like a Lee Morgan trumpet player. 
uh, real clarity, uh, real ring to his bell. Uh, Kenny Drew's on the piano, and this must have been shortly before Kenny Drew went to Europe and went for a long time. Wilbur Ware, the Chicago natives on the bass, and Philly Joe Jones on the drums. This is a great swinging hard bop session at Blue Note, like I said, 1961. And what's cool about the Tone Poets series is they are definitely covering a lot of the history of Blue Note from the early 55, 56 stuff all the way through to the sale. They're even putting out some post-sale United Artists stuff from what I've seen, Liberty stuff. Uh, they haven't seemed to dabble too much in the earlier 10-inch era stuff at all yet. But again, it's a very different era of Blue Note and very disconnected from what the main body of Blue Note hard bop represents into the 60s free, free and avant-garde stuff. Uh, Poppin' by Hank Mobley. Again, this had an awful American cover from the 80s, I believe. And uh, this is a much better cover. Art Farmers on the trumpet, who again complements uh, Mobley really well. They're both kind of mid-register players with a nice lazy, lazy, laissez-faire tempo and kind of a melancholic approach. Pepper Adams uh, has the baritone on this with Sonny Clark, Paul Chambers, and Philly Joe Jones. And so Sonny Clark's one of the real pieces that's tying a lot of this Tone Poet Blue Note stuff together. And it's funny how his time at Blue Note was really overlooked for a long time. And a lot of the sessions that didn't get issued had Sonny Clark on them. And I'm not sure on this, but my gut tells me he was a difficult person to work with. I think there was more to it in terms of why his stuff wasn't getting put out than just economics and uh, issuing dates. I, I think he was a difficult person uh, and militant and complicated and strong addictions and strong political drive. And I think Alfred and uh, Frank probably had their hands full with him at times. Some of this is conjecture, some of this is little bits I've heard and read, but I mean, it's amazing how much Sonny Clark stuff was sat on. Some of it with him as a leader, some of it as him as just like the piano player. But when you're the piano player in a jazz session, you're kind of the leader no matter what your position is in that session. You have a lot to say about what, how it's going to get played, how it's going to get played, what tempo it's going to be played at. A piano was, in a lot of ways, the, uh, the conductor of a lot of sessions, and Harbop's no exception. So Clark was always going to be a driving force. And again, like I said, he departs the label for a little while and makes a couple of records, a Time label and uh, Bob Shad's label out of New York. He comes back to Blue Note, and uh, I just think he's so strung out. And... Uh, the difficulty of the black experience in America, I think really was a toll on him. I think it really was exhausting for him. And so it's good that in retrospect, he's found that audience. His three records as a leader on Blue Note are outstanding. And all the other sessions here that, that are being issued, I think he has a real powerful missing legacy on the Blue Note canon. As important as Horace Silver was, and as important as Art Blakey was, and as important as Morgan Bird and Mobley and those guys were, I mean, they're, and they're all seminal figures of the Blue Note label. I think Sonny Clark, and I've said this before, is really one of the hidden gems and strongest motivators of the Blue Note hard bop genre. And Blue Note codifies hard, hard bop that aggressive political, social, emotional context that a lot of players can't really get into that unless you have some experiences that help you validate that. And I think Sonny Clark's experiences were all written in that hard bop expression of agitation and uh, just fomenting at the mouth and the aggressive nature of a lot of what he had to display. Not to say he couldn't play with delicacy and be a real gentle delight his Sonny Clark trio record which just got reissued on Tone Poet I mean that's a great record he can play with different emotional context but there's always a weight to it there's always a darkness underlying it and I think for Frank and Al that weight was a little tough at times to quantify and to embody and to embrace 
and I, you, t- you couple that with his addiction and his difficult nature and his, I think he was unreliable at times if I remember reading. And so I think all that led him to depart Blue Note and he eventually comes back. And well, I mean, Leaping and Lope is a great record. And I love that session, but it, it's, these, these men were difficult men. I mean, Ellington often talked about how difficult some of the men in his orchestra were. And part of what Al and Frank did at Blue Note was manage young men. The hearts and the minds and the, and the soul and the expression of these guys. Al gave them a canvas. And I think a guy like Sonny Clark probably was always kind of pushing the boundaries of what they were comfortable with. And I mean, I, some of this is just me conjecturing. But a lot of it's also just how I, my heart, my, my gut's telling me how it feels. And also... A lot of it's telling me what is playing and the, and, the, and the emotional throat grabbing that I feel at times when I'm listening to some of his sessions. There's just a, a tangled web. A tangled web. And you gotta love Sonny Clark for that. So that's today's sessions. My t- 10 favorite Blue Note tone poets. Now, I love the Katanga session on Pacific, which of course isn't a Blue Note. The Pacific stuff is also bought by United Artists, so they're, they're being kind of coupled together along with the other labels. But it's it, the heart of the monster is the Blue Note body of work. And uh, great job, Kevin. Great job. Uh, the other fellow's name I can't think of right now. Joe Harley. Good job, guys. You guys are killing it. It's a, an amazing legacy that you're adding to by issuing this stuff in an affordable and quality packaging. Uh, congrats to you guys. You deserve all the credit you're getting. And I uh, hope you all enjoy this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. And please watch some of the other episodes. It doesn't have to be about some modern reissue program for it to be of value. There's a lot of jazz history that's never going to be reissued that has context and gives you understanding of where the music was and what this meant. And even hard bop has zero meaning until you understand the modern and postmodern sounds that were happening around hard bop, the cool that was happening around hard bop. It's only with that other elements of the buffet does that dish have its purpose and meaning. You can't sit there in, a, in an isolated chamber and get its meaning and context. You have to have the entire smorgasbord of what jazz was doing to understand what this vein was about. So again, we'll wrap that up today with that. I hope you all enjoyed that. You all be safe. Grab your tone, poets. And by all means, keep shopping for old used jazz because there's so much of it out there. I see so much cool stuff on Discogs all the time. A lot of it sells for pretty affordable pricing, and so many people just don't seem interested in it. So check it out, guys. Dig dig deeper than the modern reissue canon because the modern reissue canon is maybe 5% of what jazz is really about. And you're going to miss out on a lot of great artists. You're going to miss out on a lot of great records at a good price because you didn't know no better. I mean, we all do for years. That's all part of the, the game. But, man, there's a lot of great jazz out there that just because it's not being reissued, the ignorance is tenfold of what it is for the artists that are being reissued. So dig deep. Keep searching. Keep finding the stuff. Uh, keep watching the channel. If you, if, you, if you don't watch it enough, you should watch it more. We have a lot to share here. We appreciate you guys. Have a great day. Bye.